When this present 19th century was younger by a good many years than it is now, a certain friend of mine named Arthur Holliday happened to arrive in Doncaster exactly in the middle of the race week, having decided all of a sudden in his harebrained way that he would go to the races. He went at once to see about his dinner and bed at the principal hotel. Dinner they were ready enough to give him, but as for a bed, they laughed when he mentioned it. He went on with his carpet bag in his hand, applying for a bed at every place of entertainment for travellers that he could find, until he wandered into the outskirts of the town. By this time the last glimmer of twilight had faded out, the wind was getting cold, the clouds were gathering heavily, and there was every prospect that it was soon going to rain. Down the winding road before him shone the dull gleam of an oil lamp that struggled ineffectually with the foggy darkness all round him. As he got nearer the lamp he heard voices, and walking close under it found that it lighted the entrance to a narrow court, on the wall of which was painted a long hand in faded flesh colour, pointing with a lean forefinger to the inscription, The Two Robins. On entering the passage, Arthur met a stranger with a knapsack in his hand, who was evidently leaving the house. No, said the traveller, turning round and addressing himself cheerfully to a fat, sly-looking, bald-headed man with a dirty white apron on, who had followed him down the passage. No, Mr. Landlord, I am not easily scared by trifles, but I don't mind confessing that I can't quite stand that. It occurred to young Holliday that the stranger had been asked an exorbitant price for a bed at the two robins, and that he was unable or unwilling to pay it. The moment his back was turned, Arthur, comfortably conscious of his own well-filled pockets, addressed himself to the landlord. Uh, if you have got a bed to let, he said, and if that gentleman who's just gone out won't pay your price for it, I will. The landlord rubbed his stubbly double chin. Look here. You can have a bed all to yourself for five shillings, but you can't have more than a half share of the room it stands in. You see what I mean, young gentleman? Of course I do, returned Arthur a little irritably. You mean that it is a double-bedded room and that one of the beds is occupied? The landlord nodded his head and rubbed his double chin harder than ever. Is it yes or no? he asked. Settle as quick as you can, because there's lots of people wanting a bed at Doncaster tonight besides you. Arthur looked towards the court and heard the rain falling heavily in the street outside. Here you are, he said. I'll take the bed. Arthur handed the five shillings to the landlord, who nodded, dropped the money carelessly into his waistcoat pocket, and lighted a candle. Come up and see the room, said the host of the two robins, leading the way to the staircase. It was larger and cleaner than Arthur had expected it would be. The two beds stood parallel with each other, a space of about six feet between them. The occupied bed was the bed nearest the window. The curtains were drawn round it except the half-curtain at the bottom. Arthur saw the feet of the sleeping man raising the scanty clothes into a sharp little eminence, as if he was lying flat on his back. He took the candle and advanced softly to draw the curtain, stopped halfway, and listened for a moment, and then turned to the landlord. He's a very quiet sleeper, said Arthur. Yes, said the landlord, very quiet. Young Holliday advanced with the candle and looked in at the man cautiously. Uh, how pale he is, said Arthur. Yes, returned the landlord. Pale enough, isn't he? Arthur stooped down closer over the stranger, looked at his ashy, parted lips, listened breathlessly for an instant, looked again at the strangely still face and the motionless lips and chest, and turned round suddenly on the landlord. Come here, he whispered under his breath. Come here, for God's sake. The man's not asleep. He's dead. You found that out sooner than I thought you would, said the landlord composedly. How did he die? Who is he? asked Arthur, staggered for the moment by the audacious coolness of the answer. I know no more about him than you do, rejoined the landlord. He's been here a week, paying his way fairly enough, 
and stopping indoors for the most part as if he was ailing. My girl brought him up his tea at five today, and as he was a-pouring of it out, he fell down in a faint, or a fit, or a compound of both, or anything I know. We couldn't bring him to, and I said he was dead. And the doctor couldn't bring him to, and the doctor said he was dead. And the coroner's inquest's coming as soon as it can, and that's as much as I know about it. There was a moment of silence, and the rain pattered drearily through it against the panes of the window. If you haven't got nothing more to say to me, continued the landlord, I suppose I may go. You don't expect your five shillings back, do you? I've kept my part of the bargain, and I mean to keep the money. I'm not Yorkshire myself, young gentleman, but I've lived long enough in these parts to have my wits sharpened, and I shouldn't wonder if you found out the way to brighten up yours next time you come among us. <laughs> the landlord turned towards the door and laughed to himself softly. Startled and shocked as he was, Arthur had by this time sufficiently recovered himself to feel indignant at the trick that had been played on him and at the insolent manner in which the landlord exulted in it. Don't laugh, he said sharply. You shan't have the five shillings for nothing, my man. I'll keep the bed. And I wish you a good night's rest, said the landlord, shutting the door after him. Though not naturally over-sensitive and not wanting in courage, the presence of the dead man had an instantaneously chilling effect on Arthur's mind when he found himself alone in the room. Alone and bound by his own rash words to stay there till the next morning. He advanced towards the bed and drew the curtains, purposely abstaining as he did so from looking at the face of the corpse. He went next to the window. The night was black and he could see nothing from it. The rain still pattered heavily against the glass. A distant church clock struck ten. Only ten. How was he to pass the time till the house was astir the next morning? He took a few turns up and down the room, then stopped at the foot of the occupied bed. He stretched out his hand towards the curtains, but checked himself in the very act of undrawing them, turned his back sharply on the bed, and walked towards the chimney-piece to see what things were placed on it and to try if he could keep the dead man out of his mind in that way. On the chimney-piece were two coarse china ornaments of the commonest kind and a square of embossed card, dirty and fly-blown, with a collection of wretched riddles printed on it in all sorts of zigzag directions. He took the card and went away to read it at the table on which the candle was placed, sitting down with his back resolutely turned to the curtained bed. He read the first riddle, the second, the third, all in one corner of the card, then turned it round impatiently to look at another. Before he could begin reading the riddles printed here, the sound of the church clock stopped him. Eleven. He had got through an hour of the time in the room with the dead man. Again he turned to the riddles. All his efforts, however, could not fix his attention on them. At last he gave up the struggle, threw the card from him impatiently, and took to walking softly up and down the room again. Was it only the body being there? Or was it the body being there concealed that was preying on his mind? He wiped away the damp that had gathered on his forehead, and without allowing himself an instant to hesitate, he parted the curtains at the foot of the bed and looked through. There was the sad, peaceful, white face, with the awful mystery of stillness on it, laid back upon the pillow. He only looked at it for a moment before he closed the curtains again, but that moment steadied him, calmed him, restored him, mind and body, to himself. He returned to his old occupation of walking up and down the room, persevering in it this time till the clock struck again. Twelve. As the sound of the clock bell died away, it was succeeded by the confused noise downstairs of the drinkers in the tap room leaving the house. Then the silence followed again. He was alone now, absolutely, hopelessly alone, with the dead man till the next morning.
the wick of the candle wanted trimming. In his present hesitating frame of mind, it was a kind of relief to gain a few moments only by engaging in the trifling occupation of snuffing the candle. His hand trembled a little, and the snuffers were heavy and awkward to use. When he closed them on the wick, he closed them a hair's breadth too low. In an instant the candle was out, and the room was plunged in pitch darkness. The one impression which the absence of light immediately produced on his mind was distrust of the curtained bed, distrust which shaped itself into no distinct idea, but which was powerful enough to bind him down to his chair. He had put his carpet bag on the table when he first entered the room, and he now reached out his hand softly, opened the bag, and groped in it for his travelling writing case, in which he knew that there was a small store of matches. When he had got one of the matches, he waited before he struck it on the coarse wooden table and listened intently again, without knowing why. Still, there was no sound in the room but the steady, ceaseless, rattling sound of the rain. He lighted the candle again without another moment of delay, and on the instant of its burning up, the first object in the room that his eyes sought for was the curtained bed. He saw, hanging over the side of it, a long, white hand. He stood looking at it, unable to stir, unable to call out. Every faculty he possessed gathered up and lost in the one seeing faculty. How long that first panic held him, he never could tell afterwards. How he got to the bed, how he wrought himself up to unclose the curtains and look in, he never has remembered. It is enough that he did go to the bed, and that he did look inside the curtains. The man had moved. One of his arms was outside the clothes. His face was turned a little on the pillow, and his eyelids were wide open. The face was otherwise fearfully and wonderfully unaltered. The dead paleness and the dead quiet were on it still. One glance showed Arthur this, one glance before he flew breathlessly to the door and alarmed the house. The landlord was the first to appear on the stairs. In three words Arthur told him what had happened and sent him for the nearest doctor. I who tell you this story was at the time of these events staying with a medical friend of mine in practice at Doncaster taking care of his patients for him during his absence in London. And I, for the time being, was the nearest doctor. They had sent for me from the inn when the stranger was taken ill in the afternoon, but I was not at home, and medical assistance was sought for elsewhere. When the man from the two robins rang the night bell, I was just thinking of going to bed. Naturally enough, I did not believe a word of his story about a dead man who had come to life again. However, my surprise at finding that the man had spoken the literal truth was almost equalled by my astonishment at finding myself face to face with Arthur Holliday as soon as I entered the bedroom. We shook hands amazedly, and then I ordered everybody but Arthur out of the room. With my medicines, and with such help as Arthur could render under my direction, I dragged the man literally out of the jaws of death. In less than an hour, he was alive and talking in the bed on which he had been laid out to wait for the coroner's inquest. He was a startling object to look at, with his colourless face, his sunken cheeks, his wild black eyes and his long black hair. The first question he asked me about himself when he could speak made me suspect that I had been called in to a man in my own profession. I mentioned to him my surmise and he told me that I was right. He said he had come last from Paris, where he had been attached to a hospital, that he had lately returned to England to continue his studies, that he had been taken ill on the journey, and that he had stopped to rest and recover himself at Doncaster. He did not add a word about his name or who he was. All I inquired when he ceased speaking was what branch of the profession he intended to follow. Any branch, he said bitterly, which will put bread into the mouth of a poor man.
At this, Arthur burst out impetuously in his usual good-humoured way. My dear fellow, now you come to life again, don't begin by being downhearted about your prospects. I can help you, and if I can't, I know my father can. The medical student looked at him steadily. Thank you, he said coldly, then added, May I ask who your father is? He's well enough known all about this part of the country, replied Arthur. He's a great manufacturer, and his name is Holiday. My hand was on the man's wrist during this brief conversation. The instant the name of Holiday was pronounced, I felt the pulse under my fingers flutter. I am indebted to Mr. Holiday's son, then, for the help that has saved my life, said the medical student. The stranger's wild black eyes were fixed with a look of eager interest on Arthur's face. The two faces were close together. I looked at them, and to my amazement, I was suddenly impressed by the sense of a likeness between them. You have saved my life, said the strange man. If you had been my own brother, you could not have done more for me than that. I hope I have not done being of service to you yet, said Arthur. I'll speak to my father as soon as I get home. You seem to be fond and proud of your father, said the medical student. Of course, answered Arthur, laughing. Aren't you fond of your father? The stranger suddenly dropped young Holliday's hand and turned his face away. I beg your pardon, said Arthur. I hope I have not unintentionally pained you. I hope you have not lost your father. I can't well lose what I have never had, retorted the medical student. I have no name and no father. The merciful law of society tells me I am nobody's son. Ask your father if he'll be my father too, and help me on in life with the family name. Arthur looked at me more puzzled than ever. I signed to him to say nothing, then laid my fingers again on the man's wrist. In spite of the extraordinary speech that he had just made, his pulse had fallen back to a quiet, slow beat. Finding that neither of us answered him, he turned to me and began talking of the extraordinary nature of his case and asking my advice about the future course of medical treatment. I said the matter required careful thinking over and suggested that I should send him a prescription a little later. He told me to write it at once as he would most likely be leaving Doncaster in the morning before I was up. Hearing this, Arthur volunteered the loan of a travelling writing case which he said he had with him, and bringing it to the bed, shook the notepaper out of the pocket of the case forthwith in his usual careless way. With the paper there fell out onto the counterpane of the bed a little watercolour drawing of a landscape. The medical student took up the drawing and looked at it. His eye fell on some initials neatly written in cipher in one corner. He started and trembled. His pale face grew whiter than ever. A pretty drawing, he said, in a remarkably quiet tone of voice. Ah, and done by such a pretty girl, said Arthur. I wish it was not a landscape. I wish it was a portrait of her. You admire her very much? Love at first sight, said young Holliday, putting the drawing away again. But it's the old story. She's trammelled by a rash engagement to some poor man who is never likely to get money enough to marry her. It was lucky I heard of it in time, or I should certainly have risked a declaration when she gave me that drawing. Here, Doctor, here's pen, ink and paper all ready for you. When she gave you that drawing, gave it, gave it. The stranger repeated the words slowly to himself. Then he fixed his eyes searchingly on Arthur and said, slowly and distinctly, You like her, and she likes you. The poor man may die out of your way. Who can tell that she may not give you herself, as well as her drawing, after all? Before young Holliday could answer, he turned to me and said in a whisper, Now for the prescription. From that time, though he spoke to Arthur again, he never looked at him more. When I had written the prescription, he examined it, approved of it, and then astonished us both by abruptly wishing us good night. Thank you, both, he said as we rose to go. I have one last favour to ask of Mr. Holliday.
His eyes, while he spoke, never once turned towards Arthur. I beg that Mr. Holliday will not mention to anyone, least of all to his father, the events that have occurred and the words that have passed in this room. His voice faltered for the first time, and he hid his face on the pillow. Arthur, completely bewildered, gave the required pledge. I took young Holliday away with me immediately afterwards to the house of my friend, determining to go back to the inn and to see the medical student again before he left in the morning. A suspicion had occurred to me as soon as I was alone in my bedroom. There were certain reports or scandals which I knew of relating to the early life of Arthur's father. While I was thinking of what had passed at the inn, of the change in the student's pulse when he heard the name of Holliday, of the resemblance that I had discovered between his face and Arthur's, of the emphasis he had laid on those three words, my own brother, and of his incomprehensible acknowledgement of his own illegitimacy. While I was thinking of these things, something within me whispered, it is best that those two young men should not meet again. I felt it before I slept. I felt it when I woke. And I went alone to the inn the next morning. My nameless patient had been gone nearly an hour when I inquired for him. The medical student turned out to be strangely and unaccountably right in assuming it as more than probable that Arthur Holliday would marry the young lady who had given him the watercolour drawing of the landscape. For three years, Arthur and his wife lived together happily. At the expiration of that time, the symptoms of a serious illness first declared themselves in Mrs. Holliday. It turned out to be a long, lingering, hopeless malady. I attended her throughout. I called one evening, as usual, and found her alone with a look in her eyes which told me she had been crying. She confessed to me that she had been looking over some old letters which had been addressed to her before she had seen Arthur, by a man to whom she had been engaged to be married. Her first love, as she called him, was very poor, and there was no immediate prospect of their being married. He followed my profession and went abroad to study. They had corresponded regularly until the time when, as she believed, he had returned to England. From that period she heard no more of him. He had never written to her again, and after waiting a year she had married Arthur. I asked when the first estrangement had begun, and found that the time at which she ceased to hear anything of her first lover exactly corresponded with the time at which I had been called in to my mysterious patient at the Two Robins Inn. A fortnight after that conversation, she died. I have some years to pass over before I can approach to anything like a conclusion of this fragmentary narrative. One rainy autumn evening, while I was still practising as a country doctor, I was sitting alone, thinking over a case then under my charge, which sorely perplexed me, when I heard a low knock at the door of my room. Come in, I cried, looking up curiously to see who wanted me. After a momentary delay, the lock moved, and a long, white, bony hand stole round the door. The hand was followed by a man whose face instantly struck me with a very strange sensation. There was something familiar to me in the look of him, and yet it was also something that suggested the idea of change. He quietly introduced himself as Mr. Lorne, presented to me some excellent professional recommendations, and proposed to fill the place then vacant of my assistant. Something in my own recollections, I can hardly say what, made me feel ready and glad to accept his proposal. We got on together as if we'd been old friends from the first, but throughout the whole time of his residence in my house, he never volunteered any confidences on the subject of his past life. I had long had a notion that my patient at the inn might have been a natural son of the elder Mr. Holliday's, and that he might also have been the man who was engaged to Arthur's first wife. And now another idea occurred to me, that Mr. Lorne, 
was the only person in existence who could, if he chose, enlighten me on both those doubtful points. But he never did choose, and I was never enlightened. He remained with me till I removed to London, and then he went his way and I went mine, and we have never seen one another since. I may have been right in my suspicion, or I may have been wrong. All I know is that in those days of my country practice, when I came home late and found my assistant asleep and woke him, he used to look, in coming to, wonderfully like the stranger at Doncaster, as he raised himself in the bed on that memorable night.